It's my distinct privilege to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Titus Brown, who's professor of history at Florida A&M University. Dr. Brown received his BA from Albany State College and his MS and PhD from FSU, where he studied Southern history with Dr. Rogers, Dr. Rogers, who's published four volumes on Thomas County history. So I'm sure Dr. Um, Brown was steeped in Thomas County while he was studying there. Um, we had previously worked with Dr. Brown and back in 1992, he served as humanities scholar on a collaborative project between the Historical Society and the Jack Hadley Black History Memorabilia, Inc., um, which was funded by a grant from the Georgia Humanities Council and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Dr. Dudley Sisk, who was then administrator for the Historical Society, served as project director. And under this grant, oral histories of 15 African Americans who lived and worked on Thomas County hunting plantations were recorded by Jack Hadley. A traveling photographic exhibit describing the unique lifestyle which existed on the plantations was created by museum curator Tom Hill and displayed in Thomas County Libraries and at Georgia Agorama as well as the Museum of History. Dr. Brown served as an advisor throughout this project and participated in the program and panel discussion which introduced the exhibit to the public. After all these years, that exhibit is currently undergoing refurbishment, but part of it is in the back bay on the far wall if you'd like to see some of those images after the lecture. In 2000, Dr. Brown and Jack Hadley co-authored a book entitled African American Life on the Southern Hunting Plantation. I'm sure many of you have copies of it which is largely based on the interviews described above. Dr. Brown is also the author of Albany University, A Centennial History, and Faithful, Firm, and True African American Education in the South. So please join me in welcoming him to the Historical Society this evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Uh, I feel like I'm getting old. I saw the date, 1992, I can hardly recall. <laughs> uh, I think I, in 1992, I had finished my master's and had done some work towards the doctoral philosophy degree at FSU at that point. Well, I'm certainly glad to come back to Thomas County. I love this area in terms of the research and the rich history that it has uh, to offer anyone who's serious about Southern history. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk in general about the African-American middle class uh, during what we would turn the progressive era, or 1890 to about 1914, right at the break of World War I, or perhaps uh, a little bit about some of the national leaders in the United States and how it tied in with the local uh, Thomasville community. Um, <clears throat> if, if one were to look, for example, at Thomas County in the antebellum period, uh, from about 1820, in 1820 for the most part, uh, Andrew Jackson uh, actually wanted to create a society for underprivileged people, certainly people who had not become part of the land elite and having slavery. So Andrew Jackson then took it upon himself uh, with the auspices of the federal government to remove the Creeks, Indians, Upper and Lower Creeks, as well as the ones in Florida we term Seminoles. And out of that area were carved up into partial that we refer to as the Plantation South. And Thomas County, of course, came out of that. And primarily what we have here is a plantation society producing cotton, uh, using African-American slaves uh, for work. And cotton is going to dominate uh, this particular society uh, throughout the antebellum period. And of course, there were problems with the institution of slavery. Uh, the resistance was certainly an issue. Uh, this one, of course, in 1854, Thomasville uh, ran away. Uh, 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 a young man called Ned, 22 years of age, had actually run away, I had been sold away. 
uh, and then of course wanted to go by where it come from because probably family members and so forth were in those areas. But this is a typical example. If we were to look at Southern newspaper, those of you who uh, have looked, surely have seen these, if one were to look at any Southern newspaper between this particular period, we can see uh, where rewards are being offered and individuals are actually uh, running away. By the way, in Georgia, and Florida and other southern states doing institutional slavery primarily, although this would be considered an adult. Uh, our free black population is also in the works. Uh, and I should be cr uh, clear to point out that I'm speaking on behalf of the African American male class, which is primarily an artisan class of people. But slaves in the South, too, uh, men of them on plantation were artisans uh, and, and, and on the particular area. Free black tended to be artisans too, uh, and that's how they earned their livelihood. Uh, one of the issues that was brought on about the debate in terms of the probability of having slavery and that, it was undermining whites who did not own slaves, and majority of them did. So that means that it was very difficult for an ordinary white person to compete in these societies because you had the free black population being the skilled people and then, of course, you had slaves that were doing other work because if you were non-slaveholders, it mean that was almost virtually impossible to exist in this type of society. For the most part, we find them being overseers. And these are two uh, from the from the area, uh, former slaves. Uh, and of course, this is during the emancipation period. So this is, of course, the the ratification of the system of slavery would have ended uh, in 1865. And what we see in the black community, we call it Freedom Day. Uh, jubilee, Jubilee, oh freedom, oh freedom. And we celebrate at various points throughout the United States. And Georgia and North Florida, we celebrate the 20th of May. Uh, and Texas is Juneteenth, or the 19th of June, because as the Army and the Emancipation Proclamation were being delivered to those areas, it was kind of like a ripple effect. And Texas was the last of the group of Africans, enslaved Africans, to actually been told that the war ended, and with it, emancipation. So it's sort of like become official. And so some of those holidays are still with us, and some people continue to celebrate those kinds of experience out of the institution of slavery. But what we do find, uh, and this particular piece here is a very interesting piece, and we were discussing it on last a uh, couple of days ago, an African-American fire company, of course, this is local, uh, 1869. Uh, and I pointed out that occasionally, like I think in New Orleans, Savannah, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, you would see in the, in the antebellum period that if they could have been slaves who actually were the farmer in those cities. And the post-ballum period, you will, probably would have had these people who were accustomed to the tradition, but now they are functioning to protect the African American community as well as the community at large. And we see, I saw like a new profession begin to come into being. Uh, here you have people who were slaves occasionally doing this kind of work, but now you have a new kind of profession. People as freemen can participate in this type of profession. Um, uh, Frederick Douglass, the noted African American leader, believe it or not, uh, came to Thomasville in 1889 and spoke at the Opera House. Uh, and then, of course, he journeyed to Allen Institute, which I would have discussed a little bit later on, and addressed the student body as well as the administrator of that area. Douglas is a unique individual. He gave his speech, Self-Made Man. And that's what's the most popular of all of Douglas' speeches was Self-Made Man. Note the title, Self-Made Man. So Frederick Douglass, the noted abolitionist, and by far the most famous of all black abolitionists, uh, stole his freedom. That means he ran away. And in running away, he met some of the leading abolitionists, that, those in opposition to slavery, as he moved towards the north. They said, well, this is a good person to use to propagate the notion that slavery is not good. And so Douglas was hired as a speaker for the American Anti-Slavery Society and the New England Anti-Slavery Society and occasionally ventured throughout various parts of the country lecturing. When people who own him found out about that, they said, he said, the bad example, we're going to reclaim him. Mm -hmm. And so abolitionists pulled their resources and they legitimately bought his freedom. 
so that he would be free to travel and speak out on institutional slavery. But if we, if we look at Douglas in terms of his notion, Douglas self-made man. That is, of course, that he pulled himself up by his own bootstrap. That type of philosophy is also found in Washington. And, and, and that becomes significant because Washington will become the preeminent African-American leader when Douglas died in 1895. And so now it seems like it's a void in African-American leadership in terms of who's the national spokesperson. So we see the ascendance of Washington then about the time uh, that Douglas dies in 1895. Now, like Douglas, uh, Washington come from Armour origins too because uh, as a youngster, Washington carried water to slaves who were laboring in the field. Him too was a slave. He was a youngster. And he played and he learned in play schools. That is, black kids who companion with white kids and they played school. And when they played school, they learned. And so you will find out in the, at the end of the balance period that a lot of the uh, companions so playing with white kids, the black kids, that actually they learn that way and play school because, you know, people were isolated in those days and a lot of times the only kids that uh, white and black had to play with, the, especially the people who owned the slaves, were some of the black slaves themselves and as companion. And Douglas learned the basic in this way. Uh, Douglas Malata, he said his father was white, uh, a slave mother, uh, worked in the salt mines later on during the reconstruction period. Uh, convinced his stepfather to allow him to take an occasional class here and two in one of those freedmen schools that emerged during that period, during the Reconstruction period. And he walked to Hampton University with 50 cents in his pocket. And he said he slept under the board, rocks and crosswalks under bridges and so forth uh, to stay out of the element and walking there. When he got to Hampton University, Samuel Armstrong befriended him, who was an abolitionist of the sort, but also a general, ex-Union general. Uh, Armstrong's father had been long in the missionary tradition. They were missionary. They had traveled throughout various parts of Asia, setting up the educational institution. So he felt then that Hampton would be a good place to set up an institution. And this is significant because these schools is similar to what's going to happen in Thomasville with Allen. And that's why I'm spending as much time with Hampton discussing this, because it's an outgrowth of the same organization, American Missionary Association. Uh, the American Missionary Association were headquartered in New York, uh, and they sent teachers down to the fields. That means that these are young single women, usually, sometimes they are men. Uh, a lot of time, the majority of these were unmarried white women who had been nurses during the Civil War, or who had gone off to schools. And there were so many of them, because you know women were supposed to be housewives. And so the, the two professions over for women were nursing and teaching, for the most part. And so and from the north then, you got all these people who've been trained as teachers. And there's not enough academies around to actually use them. So they felt they were going to good service indeed and missionary to coming down here and to help to educate the, the newly liberated slaves. So Mary S. Pete then in 1861 orchestrated what became known as Hampton University. She was a black teacher who came in under the auspices of the American Missionary Association. And she's joined by a couple of other teachers in early 1861 when Union Army began to occupy that area. So Washington goes to Hampton. And you see Washington is befriended by Armstrong who take personal interest in him. So Armstrong is of the notion that in the United States that African American is best served by using it vocational and industrial education. And so he pushed vocational and industrial education. That is, of course, that one must know how to use the hand and those kinds of skill, and that liberal arts education was kind of useless in a late 18th century, early 20th century society for blacks, and that you had to have some kind of utilitarian knowledge. That is, of course, know how to build things. Um, Washington learned those kinds of skills while he was at Hampton, and in 1881, when the state of Alabama began to move towards creating some type of normal institution for blacks, uh, they asked him, Armstrong gave good recommendation because he, of course, Washington had gone to seminary, became a minister, uh, and other kinds of things as well, and additional school too. 
Uh, but he owed a Native American student, by the way, while he was at Hampton, because he asked him to come by to Hampton. He taught for a while in his own town of Walden, Malden, West Virginia. That's in Franklin County. That's coal mining country today. Uh, and it's being re and you might have heard some of the, the, the discussion on the news recently. Uh, a lot of those areas, it's a beautiful country. I actually traveled up there, and I've gone to some of that area where he grew up at, in Franklin County, West Virginia. Uh, it certainly is beautiful. Uh, Washington leaves Hampton in 1881, come to Tuskegee, and found the Tuskegee Institute. But he understands the, the, the social order and political situation of Alabama. So that school prospers. He get endorsement from people like Andrew Carnegie, who is the largest steel baron, uh, Long Henry Baldwin, the New Island Railroads, and some of these other people uh, uh, befriend him. So he has no problem. The, school, the students build all the building themselves with bricks. They mold it at the university. They do the lumber and they spin the pine rails and all this stuff to build the buildings. And they hire some of the new Robert Robson Taylors and a couple other by architecture to come and design the building. So Washington wants to show that, hey, this is what the race can do. And so he has trained at Tuskegee and at Hampton, this utilitarian tr trade of people, that means brick masonry, carpenters, carriage maker, seamstress, uh, and, and these are the people that will later make up the black male class. These are the people who first make up the black male class. See, in the African American community, Education is the key for middle class in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And if you don't have those normal school education, then you have to have some of those kinds of skills. And if you have those skills, primarily they are provided for in the same kinds of institution. You see these normal institutions provided two types of studies. You can go college prep. That means you're going to be, become a teacher, and there was no certification in the late, in the earlier period, but then begin to go towards certification later on. So one could take two tries. One could take, what well, they're going to become a normal teacher. That is, of course, you're going to be teaching. And primarily, most of the schools only went from third to sixth grade, so if you went through a normal course of instruction, then you could qualify to teach at one of these schools. Uh, that wasn't true of Allen, of course. Allen is an institute. Now, there's a distinct difference. These people have to be degreed. Uh, and to teach at those because they are college preparatory as well. So a lot of those people were American missionary people would go to places like Talladega, Atlanta University, Howard University, and Fisk University was the key early on. And later on when state began to move towards a four-year institution, places like Florida and M, which is a state supported school, or Georgia State, now called Savannah State, could provide that. But most of those schools were no more than an institute or a junior college until the fourth. So uh, I think the closest one would be Florida and m but then one would have to go to a private school primarily to get four years of training, uh, and that would be in those at schools in Atlanta because the state then moved into that direction, other than in Tallahassee, but Florida and m had in the 1920s. So Washington emerged then in, in the, at the International Cotton State Exposition, and look, he joined this in 1897, but a year, about two years earlier, uh, actually, uh, yeah, two years earlier, he had become international known. He spoke in Atlanta at the International Cotton State in Exposition. Uh, and that, of course, you, I've got a habit of moving away from the mic. Um, he spoke in Atlanta at the International Exposition, which is uh, the South wanted to say, okay, we've come back into our own now. Uh, we've, we, 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 we followed through from the war. We are experiencing new industrialism. Uh, then it's spreading in the South, and we have diversified our agricultural outlook. That is, the South is now beginning to move beyond cotton. Uh, and just to mention a few of the things, peanuts, soybean products, uh, a more diversified southern textile industry in the Piedmont area mostly is beginning to come into the South. Furniture making, High Point, North Carolina is giving you an example. And people begin to look at the turpentine industry and neighbor store industry, which is the whole of this whole region. Uh, and, and, it, and it began to change in many different uh, dimensions of the South away from just that one crop of cotton. So Washington and Atlanta had urged the race to say, okay, uh, we've had as a group 22 black representatives from 1870 to about 1901, but we don't necessarily have to be concerned with that. What we want to do is own land. We want to have economic independence. We can be as one as the handy, meaning black and white, but we can be as separate as the fingers. 
cultivate friendly relationship with your neighbor, meaning white people, and be prudent and use your hand for utilitarian type of training. So Washington then is speaking in tune with appeasing the reality of the South because he feels that this is the only direction and, and, and uh, legitimate direction for African American to go. And so Thomasville people saw Washington as a good opportunity to bring him to it in 1897. So in 1897, then the Time Enterprise is noted that the distinguished uh, book of Washington has come. And on a few years earlier, you see you got Douglas coming. I think that it's significant to have the two premier African-American leaders to come into one term within a few years. Uh, Washington comes here, he gets favorable impression. He's now become international known, as I mentioned before, uh, Douglas has died, and Washington is a true private broker. He has, once we get the telegraph and the telephone, he has direct line with the president. That's that in terms of representing a group of people. Uh, he should, truly is an amazing individual. His biggest adversary will do it W.B. Du Bois. Now, Du Bois is unlike Washington is uh, elitist. Du Bois grew up middle class, so he can't. He, he doesn't sympathize with agriculture and that stuff. He's brilliant. Uh, he goes down to Tennessee and goes to Fisk University, one of the leading black new universities in the country, founded by the American Missionary Association. Uh, does great work there. Uh, grew up in Boston, Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Uh, mixed ancestral background, primarily uh, not as mixed as, uh, uh, as uh, Washington, of course. The boys, both parents were black, but he claims some Dutch, French, Huguenot, and all these other backgrounds somewhere, and his ancestral linkage. Uh, he, goes to, he goes to Harvard. He finished the uh, Fisk, and he gets a scholarship to Harvard. Harvard won't accept the Fisk scholarship as, a, as a, like a, like a four-year degree. So he starts out like a junior, but they are impressed with his intellect and his ability. So they give him a, he did one of the commencement events, believe it or not, and guess what he wrote on? Jefferson Davis. Uh, it, so, <laughs> so he, uh, and this was picked up by the national leading newspaper, because you know, here you have this person who is being showcased as a prodigy of the race, you see, and Du Bois is there, and Harvard likes him, so they say, well, uh, maybe we should help him go further. He goes to Berlin, Germany, to do graduate studies at the University of Berlin, you know, was supposed to be the epitome of scientific research in those days. And one of the persons he studied with was Max Weber, you know, the urban sociologist. Uh, his forms run short, so he doesn't finish the doctoral there, so he come back to Harvard and he complete his doctorate at Harvard. I'll mention this because the board's going to emerge as an opposition to what some of Washington is saying, but those two eventually become two of the most powerful bike leader in the United States. But when you look at them, they are arguing the same thing, it's just that Du Bois is more advocate for integration. He wants to integrate society. Mm -hmm. He wants black to be for inclusion and political process, and, and that, doesn't ex that doesn't exist at this time. So Washington is urging more or less land ownership, home ownership, and land, not that Du Bois doesn't argue this point too, but he feels that without that participation and local and national political prospect, then there's something left out, and then the protection is not there. This is he as an age uh, later on. And he doesn't know he's going to live so long. I think he died at 96. He wrote four autobiographies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, so what is it then, so what is it that the middle class won't? Okay. You have to, okay, let's try to define this because it's going to trickle down to Thomasville, the Niagara Movement, which is the forerunner of the NAACP. So in 1895, a group of people began to meet to look at the political situation confronting in, in black America. Now, notice where they are meeting. Okay, it's a silent protest. They go on in Canada on the Niagara side and protest and they send this shot here. But believe it or not, the NAACP is going to assault this organization in 1909, but it is going to become a reality because Washington doesn't support it, and Washington has the support of the black press. Uh, and so this movement, as far as it doesn't become that significant over the years. Um, but some wealth of whites uh, will support it. Uh, the movement and uh, a number of wealthy white organ uh, organizational people, uh, Spangor, which is a famous trial lawyer, Phillips Garrison, the, the grandson of William Lord Garrison, the great abolitionist, Mayor White Overton, a wealthy social worker uh, up in New York, will support 
the organization, and they're going to help organize it. And believe it or not, when it's created, the NAACP, this is our garrison here, uh, one of the founders of the NAACP. See, you look at the National Organization for Advancement of Color People were founded as a political tool to litigate larger umbrella issues in the Supreme Court. It wasn't looked at to deal with a lot of local issues, although it circulated locally and issued its official order was the crisis. Now remember, this is progressive. What's progressive? Progressive is a movement going on. It's primarily it's what? An urban middle class movement. If we look at it in historical uh, uh, terminology and connotation. So as white America began to grapple with what? Child labor laws, uh, our and work conditions, the right to unionize, Black folks too began to look at some of these issues confronting the race. So you got what in the ACP, and a little bit, and one year later you got the Urban League, which is to assist people in that transition from a social rural setting to an urban setting, and and, and assist in that way. Oh, again, the Urban League too was founded as a biracial organization. Uh, so uh, the NAACP then found its way to Thomasville. This is the Orient Crisis. And Boyce is the only black person that actually held up a leadership position in that organization when it was small. And he was editor of the Crisis, which was official uh, publication of the association. And you see he highlighted the black you know, class on his cover in the earlier year. And that's what he did. He's the leader of the National Negro Business League in 1900. And Thomasville had a chapter. And so this chapter was to encourage black businessmen to, in an organizational format to be what? Economic independence and to own their businesses. And we're going to see some of those a little bit later on and we'll talk about how that worked. So the local chapter then of the National Negro Business League formulated in 1900 then and they are meeting. Now I think so these people are the leaders of the organization throughout parts of the United States. Okay, and that's the boys me with some of his colleagues. Now it's interesting to note that Washington has strength in Florida. He has strength in most southern states, a lot of it. But that was a group in Atlanta that was kind of more in count with Du Bois because Du Bois taught at Atlanta University. See, so he knew, and, and believe it or not, Atlanta has a, 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 a nice black middle class too. And Du Bois kind of interact with them there. He does it, and actually he comes to Albany and he writes his article for War's Work, which became quite famous because he interviewed every black person in Albany and Dorothy County and talks about their styles and so forth and talk about their advances and what they were doing and what they were not doing and, 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 and took great photographs of it. Look at these professions. This is a typical professional person in a southern town, but look at the numbers of what Thomasville has. This is 1909. Physicians, two. There's one pharmacist, a dentist. Nurses, when, and I think uh, ministers, the biggest profession would be teachers, we see that. Uh, uh, and they, are te they would be teaching at county and state supported schools as well as private schools. Uh, ministers in some of the churches we'll see later on, uh, which is going to dominate. If we were to look at, look at uh, the profession and civil service, that is federal, I believe it would be, and that would come under certain kind of federal appointment because the United States is moving now from a merit system or patronage system to one based on merit, which means you have to what to get tested in order to get some of these positions. So it, 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 it eliminates, I guess I should say, uh, it makes all like impartial in terms of hiring and gaining support. Uh, and these positions are going to dominate uh, in African American society until the 1960s, these are the same time. There are a few that will be a well, I actually become dated, uh, and I think you can know the ones. Okay, the industrial occupation. Obviously, you don't have much people who are doing wheel rides in the 60s, but it's going to dominate up throughout the 20s uh, in terms of uh, the profession that we have, in terms of what people are doing. Look, this one is uh, according to Holloway. Holloway was a, a, a rural sociologist uh, from Tuskegee who became pastor of the Congregationalist Church here. Uh, and he did a study. And part of this, the lecture that I'm doing is based on his study. He was he an was a, a, a expert in rural sociology. And the American Missionary Association commissioned him to go and look at Thomasville because they wanted to showcase Thomasville. And what Thomasville was doing, it should be an example of what black people were doing throughout the South. And, and so they felt very pleased with the Congregational Church 
Al-Anon and so forth in the Farmersville community. And in the fight so peace where they, it became part of a book that they published about 1909, which I used in order to put together this presentation. Um, Carpentry, according to, I, I want to get back to this because, and I think we need to do more research, the community needs to do more research on this one because I don't know to what extent, but according to Holloway and of course, and of course most people uh, in the community know this, that as northerners become to begin to come down to Tallahassee uh, and Thomasville area, uh, they stop by that, that Florida line and Thomasville seemed to be a more likely place to stop. And in doing so, uh, it created a different kinds of structure in society here. Uh, and, and so people talked about that, but it was great wealth, some of the wealth that was part of the progressive era. In other words, you got the rise of big business, what we call excess wealth. And when you look at uh, the makeup of the United States in the late 1890s because of the rise of industrialism uh, and, and those kinds of things, uh, Thomasville becoming a resort. And, and as people come down, you're going to need carpenters, you're going to need brick masons, you're going to need all these professions, you see. So that means it was a viable. So African Americans, according to Holloway in his study, two-thirds of the black population patronized the black people. But here, they also were able to get much of the patronage from the larger white society because white people didn't make up this profession in the city of Thomas, in Thomas County at that point. Uh, and and it, it was that way throughout much of the South, but we began to see a change in the late 20s and early 30s in terms of these types of profession. But those earlier profession, even in slavery and freedom, these professions are dominated by the African American community. And according to Ho uh, Holloway, much of the homes that you see in Thomasville, some of which are still standing, were built by black carpenters and masonry. And I think that that's certain room for some research to see who some of these people were who, who built these uh, homes here. Uh, and many, unlike a lot of places, I think the Thomas County community has done a great job is keeping some of those things intact. And preservation uh, is certainly here to see the way the city was in the late 18th century and early 20th century. Um, another kinds of business enterprise, again, these would have been people who would have been encouraged by Washington through the Negro Business League and the Thomasville County Negro Business League. Drugstore, groceries, 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 undertaker. Uh, okay, key point here. And I don't see one up here that might have been that I overlooked. You have to keep in mind now that these people cater to both the black community and the white community. Now that's going to change in the 1930s, but early on they're catering to both races. Uh, caterers, hairdressers, barbers, those are black positions. Uh, and it's going to change in the late 20s and the 30s, and you begin to see white people take up these professions. But the earlier ones are going to be dominated by the African American community. The ones who cut white hair, cut white hair, they don't cut black hair unless they're doing somewhere else. Uh, and, and, though, and, you know, and, and, and I don't know what happened here. In many instances, they might hold a, own a hotel and were catering to the white community. Uh, that sometimes happened too uh, in, in the African American community. And we begin to see it changes over in the, in the as we move through the 20s. This is an at home of uh, Thomasville African American landlord. And according to Holloway, again, the guy who did this study on Thomas County and rural sociologist, he claimed that this particular house, I think it's still there now, uh, that not only did he own this house, that in areas surrounding this house, he had tenants and rental properties. Uh, that he rented out in this area. And I don't know this person's name. I, I mention it so that if someone knows they can help me with it now. They say the largest African American um, landowner during this time was a, a Miss, I think it was a, a, a Tuma, a Hamilton Tuma, uh, that, and it was a widow, and that she was the largest uh, owner uh, during this particular period. But he mentioned several people who were substantial uh, tenant home owners during the period. Um, Again, Gibson, and this is on the Mr. Hatley tour of, of, of Blight Heritage Tour in Thomas County. Uh, brick Mason, and I'm sure he put his hand on some of the bricks in this area. Uh, in carpentry skill is certainly there. And again, this came from Christian Reconstruction, H. Paul Douglas' book uh, in 1909. And by the way, I, I found this, believe it or not, in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, I was up at a conference in 96, 97. And I was in, some of you might be familiar with it, what is it, Blight Mountain, I think it is, North Carolina, and an old antique store. And I said, oh, this, I, I, the book, 
I said, oh, I saw Thomas and I saw the photograph. I said, I'm going to get this book. Mm -hmm. So I purchased the book and I said, there's some interesting things about the book because I was familiar with H. Paul Douglas because I write on the American Missionary Association. And so I was kind of fascinated with it. And, and when it saw Thomas kind of been written up in, I said, it's kind of unique and I'm going to do something with it a little bit later on. Um, and so that just happened because it's a very rare book. In fact, it is so rare that none of the schools in Florida has it. And, and it would be hard to find it in Georgia. And this, we need to identify this. That's a magnificent looking drug store, isn't it? This is Thomas County, by the way. This is from A. Paul Douglas book too. Uh, and this proprietor, I think I tried to get with Mr. Hatley. We tried to identify this person by using some of the old city directories, but I didn't think this person named Suffrage. But we might be able to trace who this person is by the 1900 census and maybe the 1910 census and, and see if we can identify who this person is. Um, Again, we talk about entrepreneurship. Well, Number now, the National Business, business League is here, and its 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 intention is to encourage the development of what economic improvement. Now, remember, this whole period is called philanthropists and self-help. That you help yourself, give back to the community, and that's what the middle class does. Now, the middle class is uh, they copy the larger society. That means they duplicate the effort throughout history, or or, or the white upper class. Uh, but it grew out of the development of a white community following the American Revolution when you got free blacks in the North. In Boston, New York, uh, what a sizable white population, and occasionally you would have it in Philadelphia. So in those areas, you got a sizable free black population. So what the first thing they do when you get a black population? Churches, the black community got churches, schools, for fraternal order, meaning Freemasonry. And Prince Hall came out of that as the first African-American Masonic Lodge. See, you find all of this in Tallahassee. You find it, all of it. You got your schools, you got your fraternal lodges, you got literary society among uh, 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 black women who are reading and participating in group discussion. You got the National Federation of Women Club, which has become the National Council of Negro Women. They are here. And see, they have over 40 different members. They're reading societies a literary society here in Thomas County during this period. So they are, they have a home for the age that they're self-sustaining here, as well as a number of churches. And when you look at the churches, they're quite unusual for the population of this size here. And they are on the, uh, the Black History Tour and Trail. We think this West Jackson Street, somebody rescue me if I'm wrong, uh, where they say that there were three blocks here in Thomasville that were Black businesses. And see it in this area here. <laughs> okay, now. Uh, that's the Flipper family. I think locally everyone can uh, relate to that family. Uh, Hen uh, uh, all of us know a little bit about Henry Flipper. Flipper was a, uh, in his family, it's, it's, it's a good example of what happened in the black girl. Okay, you, you had the first graduate of uh, West Point, then you have a couple of brothers going to Atlanta University, ministry, uh, uh, education, uh, profession. Uh, and then you have what skilled artisans as well in that family. And that's typical of the black middle class doing this here. Uh, but with that many people participating in this, it certainly shows a lot in terms of what's going on here. Shoe shop, okay. And that's, I think this is the photograph of it here. Notice that they look like they need some oaks, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, look at that now. So, you know, that who made that wheel for that carriage? Who made that carriage? You see, someone has a profession doing that. That's a lucrative business. You see, because so, people, that's the only mode, unless you have a wagon. And then if you have a wagon, you need blacksmith, you need wheel rights. You see, so that means it's a professional artisan which is faulting the feeding of the African American elite of the black middle class, which is more artisans. Uh, they, they tend to be artisans or they're educators uh, in the medical profession. That's downtown, what people come 
from the bike, from the, you know, they're moving. Downtown is a discussion for what's happened during the week and people communicate with friends. Uh, Saturday, uh, Saturday afternoon when they, they come in from whatever they've done and they take off from work and so forth and they communicate in the area of downtown generally what you find in the African American portion and they, and, they, and they set up and they go elsewhere of course and do shopping as well. But in Thomas County, most of the things that in a particular group were needed, black people were producing and selling them, which is very unique. And, and this is why, uh, again, you've got a sort of trickle down economics, of course, but you also have uh, this notion of black solidarity taking place, which is being preached by both Washington and Du Bois. And by the way, they did write one book together. It's called A Negro in the South. And he wrote half of it, and Du Bois wrote half of it. Now, that's the only thing I ever seen them do together. Uh, uh, but they, if you look at it, they have different political ideology, but pretty much in terms of uh, self-reliance and, and, and hard work is, a, is an ingredient found in both of their political uh, persuasion. Again, this is a grocery. I'm told this Freeman School is the site of Allen Norman School. This is the most this is the bright spot in black folks' life uh, in the 1890s and 20th century. Education is the brightest spot. Uh, you there's no more voting much uh, and participating in that, uh, but the schools are on the rise. The schools are on the rise. And so even people who had been strong proponent of the political situation, we found that in the late 1880s and 90s and so forth, they're more or less arguing if it's political, if the politics become for the right of an education. And so we begin to see it. And Alan Norma School in, in 1887, of course, was brought here from Brooks County when it burned there. And land, of course, were appropriated in this area for its development. Again, you're talking about American Missionary Association, which is the largest organization in the support of education for blacks in the South, period. Again, they were headquartered in New York. Uh, okay, look what they are doing. They are transplanting a Yankee value system or religion moral and uh, education. Look what they're doing. They transplant a Yankee value system based on religion, morality, and education. Which means then that if they're going to support it, because the South has not appropriated school for what we call universal education, most people are privileged when they go into the academies and so forth. And so that means that poor whites don't have what Allen is. Do you understand me now? Unless you're in a select education, uh, uh, location, you won't have it, or not like this. And that's true of where you find the American Missionary Association School. In Berea, Kentucky, they had an integrated school. We know it now at Berea College. It was integrated in the late 19th century. It was mountainous blacks and white going there. They also have institution in Asia, in parts of China, they have schools, and they work with Native American and the Dakotas especially the, the Sioux Indians and the, and the Cheyenne Indians. They had set up the missionary society there to assist in that way as well. They would have allowed integration in their school system, but that was against the, the state laws in many instances. And in the late 1890s and so forth, they didn't, want to in, they didn't want to interfere so much with local customs. They learned their lessons from that. Uh, and they decided it was best that they could accomplish more uh, in the educational effort if they didn't interfere in politics, in regional politics. And so Alan Norman then for Thomas County is the training of the African American elite by far. Because it, it training, it teaches education, but not only that, it has industrial and vocational components for people who don't want to go all the way through their preparations. So that at least they have some utilitarian value here. Uh, one could go further somewhere like Tuskegee, or have to, but look at the distance and how many people can literally go that far uh, for education. You certainly have to have uh, uh, a decent amount of money. So Allen has a boarding component so that women can come from other parts of the state region that is, like southwestern area. That mean it, it would be in Thomasville, but you could serve other adjacent counties as well. And that generally will happen when you have boarding schools. Uh, guys, well, it become co-ed later on and guys are going. But women are in the dormitory, guys are not there like they participants in the, in, in the uh, school. Uh, most of it, and it's, it's, a, it's a biracial faculty, uh, blacks and white teachers. Then most of the white, again, migrated from the 
uh, in other parts of the country and come here and provide services as teachers. And this is what I will put, I could think with a postal card of Alan Elmer. Fast and Alan Elmer. They taught by way of class that they couldn't function today not with state support because of uh, federal support because religion was very much part of the American Missionary Association School. They taught class in Bible and, and religious study. That was part of the curriculum. So in, in attending any of the American Missionary Association School, one also had to take Bible instruction uh, as well as the other parts of the class that were taken. And the Congregationalist Church, which is still here, uh, would have played a significant role in that, and that people who were part of Alan Norman, the pupils, and the uh, parents that supported it would have been members of that church as well. And one of the arguments that they, they may had too was that they felt that they were doing a disservice to many ways, but they said that they were catering to the black middle class and they wanted to reach all people. And, but it was a dilemma because unless you just open up your doors and they sometimes did take in people, but they had to charge a minimum fee. So most of the places you see this, it has some, some donation and some philanthropic efforts involved in that. But you would find the local Thomasville community would have provided most of the resources for the school, you see. So therefore, it become increasingly difficult for people who were not part of that type of structure for to attain an education. Uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, the county would have support third grade, sometime up to sixth grade. But if one wanted to go through our high school, then it would have had to go through some private school because that would not have come until the 1920s. And the state of Georgia began to create black high <coughs> school in the 1920s. If one wanted to attain beyond that point of uh, prior to that, it would have had to go through some private school. Again, we're talking about basketball at a school. That's kind of unusual, unless it's an uh, uh, institute or college during this period. Cover Hill Plantation, which in itself is unusual because there's real class blacks on that plantation and some of the others too. See, that's kind of, that's very unusual to find those kinds of people uh, uh, in those uh, uh, agrarian and rural settings. And one probably would find that many of the individuals in those areas would have gone to Allen Normal School and also would have gone to Southwest Georgia, which we call Auburn Normal or Florida a and or would have gone up to Atlanta University of Fish, the Tuskegee Institute as well. You're going to see that people and surrounding area on various kinds of areas would go to. And I met Mr. Charles Lawson and his ancestor, ancestors, who was in the audience, by the way. Religion played a significant role in the black community. After emancipation, uh, religion is primarily, we're going to see it about uh, the Methodist Church and about the church. They form what we call conventions. That means that people, the Eddy Church bishops, went around and set up these kinds of churches. Traveling bishops went and set up churches in various locales throughout the South in 1865, 66, 67, and 68. By 68, you, you, they are holy conventions like Methodist, AME conventions, and the Baptist convention. That means that they are statewide agencies, sometimes regional and national conventions. And with that, of course, you get the, the, these very different churches. This one I told once, but this is not, not necessarily this original structure, but the church itself, sometimes uh, was the butchering for both slaves and, and, and whites so, uh, in, a, in an earlier period. I think this one is about 1900 or so. And these, by the way, were provided to me by Mr. Houghton in his tour. My olive printer is about the church. She got another example. Occasionally you see Catholics among blacks, but it's if you see a Catholic among a black in Thomasville during this period or earlier, they would have moved here from somewhere else or the people who owned them would have had the Catholic background. And so they would have had some orientation towards that. And you would see this especially in New Orleans, uh, in Mobile, Alabama. And then in certain areas, for example, the Presbyterian, you will find Presbyterian here for sure uh, uh, in, in the uh, Reconstruction period of the dawn of the century. But most of them you're going to see in Presbyterian and Presbyterian, occasional Catholic here and there, and then they're going to be Methodist and Baptist churches in, in, in this area. But they'd be dominated by Methodist and Baptist. Mm -hmm. 
love for me. They are magnificent structure and they certainly reflect into the notion of what? The black elite. And not so some and we say black elite don't don't uh, we, we we can push it too far with that. Uh because for a middle class uh blacks in those days it simply meant being skilled on uh, a wage earner or uh, able to be self sufficient, a little money saved and put aside that you can educate your kids and become educated in terms of education that automatically put one into middle class for the most part because you become self and solid independent. Uh, and so that's, that's what we find. But the conjugation uh, would have been made of the entire community would have been involved with these various conjugations. But the, uh, the, uh, the leadership certainly would have come primarily for the educated elite part of the conjugation. Crazy, no, industrial school. Which is probably typical of most schools, unless you had something like a what? An Allen no, This would be typical of one room or two rooms uh, that was probably drew out various parts of the top. And here again, sometimes it would have been met with support by, and I'm really familiar with these people, the Peabody Funds, Slater Funds, or the Julia, or the Rockefeller Funds. Rockefeller set aside money for African American education, as did Peabody, and Slater did too, was an industrialist, and set up schools throughout various parts <coughs> of the South. And sometimes there was another area of so donating money with the Daniel Hand Fund uh, for black education in the South. Okay. This is certainly there in part of the tour. I think this is, is this the one that Andrew Young lived in? Yes. Uh -huh. Who Pat, uh, who actually was the minister of the Congregationist Church at one point, and uh, Thomas Hill. Yeah. Again, part of the community. And I, I, here again, I have to applaud Thomas County and preservation of these types of homes. Because in most places they are not in existence, they have been torn down or left to deteriorate. I first, I took this tour of these homes some years ago, Mr. Hatton took me through the tour, and I first encountered these homes. And when I did that, I didn't realize, I hadn't done this study then, but I didn't realize the connection was made that many of the people that, that was written in that article actually were a part of these houses here that are still in the city. In other words, I didn't know they were still here. <laughs> See, my center organization, as we already alluded to, we're very much in keeping with the notion of self-help and community development and other race, race solidarity. Congregationalist Church, 1891. <coughs> I thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, you have a chance to talk to the schools here in Thomasville about this history? Uh, not here, but I used to work at the archives at Florida A&M University, and there were lots of kids who would come. Uh, but I think that Mr. Hatley does a lot of it, speaking with school-age kids in terms of uh, the tour. And I had the opportunity to see parts of uh, the tour which has gotten better in terms of preservation and so we do need to get more of the community involved with this tour and, and make it accessible to history because I don't think a lot of people understand what, exactly what it is in terms of this region how significant it is. Right. Any other comments? Well thank you very much for putting up with me this evening. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Dr. Brown. I know Dr. Brown has mentioned while working on this presentation, he hadn't added Dr. Rogers' last book to his library, so we'd like to give this to oh, you for an appreciation. And and I'll, I'll I can't prepare to buy it. But you'll accept it. Thank you very much. Thank you all. This concludes our lecture series, and we'll be um, announcing a program for May soon, so we hope you'll be back. And come and bring your friends to visit the museum. Thank you again.